Welcome to Difficult Research. I just want to thank you for being along with me during this series. We are reading the book Visions of Glory, which was a go-to for my former aunt. There's the book right there, Visions of Glory. It's right there as she's being served in Hawaii to produce her children within five days in Idaho. John Pontius, Tom Harrison, uh, Seeking Justice Through Understanding, KJ and the Rays. Shout out to all the Rays. Love you guys. It's an op-ed series into Chad and Lori Daybell's go-to book, Visions of Glory. And as Judge Boyce put it, exploring Lori Daybell's bizarre religious rabbit hole. It's where I've been for the past four damn years. I hope everybody is good and well and, and ready to get into some vision glory ace. We're going to get into some visions of glory ass. <laughs> like to hear it? Here it goes. The next talk point says, a conference to be spoken of throughout eternity. Hmm. This might have to do with some polygamy. <laughs> He's not going to come right out and say it. It's very coded within the uh, within the text. And that's, that's what I mean by code talk. A conference to be spoken of throughout eternity. John says, so let's go on to the conference. Spencer, so I was downtown working and there were a lot of individuals working with us. And there was a change that was taking place in the earth. It was a glorious change. It had tempered the elements. It was like the earth had been knocked off its axis. To some degree, it was almost like we were living in a really temperate area, like we had now become kind of equatorial, equatorial zone, and it was very temperate. It was lovely, and we were working hard, but we noticed each day or each week we got stronger. Our bodies are getting stronger. We are able to do more. And we didn't have to eat as much. Translated beings is coming soon. <laughs> I can feel it. We didn't have to rest as much. Oh yeah. Translated beings coming. And so there was this wonderful change that was coming over the entire nation of the survivors. And we as a church really came together. It was this glorious Zion coming together. It was lovely. A lot of the brethren were killed either by the earthquake or by the illness. We were having mass funerals. The first of these conferences, John, was a mass funeral where everyone was invited and we all gathered. We all gathered around Temple Square. It was lovely. We were all there and they had speakers and we could hear what was going on in those sessions. They were like conference, but they were also funerals for those that departed. Does that make sense? Oh my goodness. I'm picking up some code here. Does that make sense? And so, I wasn't invited to the first two sessions. There were tickets handed out, and I was fortunate enough to get a red ticket. That was for the third session of conference. The third conference, it was by invitation only. Nod, nod, wink, wink. I said the nod, nod, wink, wink. <laughs> mm -mm -mm. This is how one gets their second anointing. It's an invitation only by the president, prophet, the living president, prophet. So, today's world, that would be Nelson. Okay, it says, and for those of us who were allowed to be at the third session of conference, during the second conference, there was this wonderful meeting that had taken place in the upper room of, <laughs> in the upper room of the Salt Lake Temple. Bingo. This is, this is uh, the infamous Reddit email from Melanie Gibb. Where Chad and Lori met in another upper room, and Moroni gave Lori to Chad. The Savior was there. Mm -hmm. Chad and Moroni had been married to Lori in previous probations. She was their favorite spouse. I have that memorized. <laughs> that was from memory. That's crazy. I hope that don't make me crazy. <laughs> Obsessed, maybe. Truth seeking, definitely. Truth seeking, yes. Spencer goes on to say, Have any of you been there? It is called the assembly room. Oh, yeah, this is a solemn assembly. Uh-uh. <laughs> and that was the first time we, that was the first time when we had realized what had really happened. Because in that meeting, there were dispensational prophets and there were dead prophets. There were individuals who had come back and they were reporting. 
And that was a glorious meeting. I don't think that this is a time and place to go into great detail about that, but it was incredibly spiritual. So we were all then escorted and we were able to go over to the conference center. This was not being publicly broadcasted. Another pattern. Trains dream. Chad. This is where the church was reorganizing those that had died. Huh. So it was calling new individuals into the offices where there were vacancies. Joseph and Christ. The transformation begins is the next talk point. Spencer says, brethren and sisters, Christ runs this church. He is the head. And that became more and more manifest during this time. And I testify to you that he comes to his people in their needs and he manifests himself to them in the conference. This is when Lori, I'm telling you, this is when Lori saw Jesus in the temple and Zalima too. When Christ was introduced and transformed, initially we realized that he was a man on the stand. He was a man on the stand, <laughs> anyways, who had been working with us on the grounds, helping us clean up. Oh, Lord, that is the Savior we worship. He was busily working and he was not in his glorified state, as you indicated, Kenneth. And we who had been working side by side, sharing water with him, were amazed. Hmm. And he transformed himself into the savior of this world. Okay. They do have different worlds in the temple. Before Christ spoke, the prophet Joseph Smith, this is going to go good with that document I have. The prophet Joseph Smith of this dispensation spoke. Now that is a treat to hear the prophet of this dispensation read to you those scriptures. If you want to know what he said in that conference, and if you want to know what Christ said in that conference, Go to the topical guide in your scriptures <laughs> instruction, y'all, about Zion. And he put that in quotes, quote, Zion, end quote, the restoration of Zion. And to hear those scriptures spoken by the son, by the savior, by the redeemer, and to hear those things brought together in this wonderful confluence of Joseph and the savior, those truths will be spoken of throughout eternity. For the impact of that upon the church knitted us together and created a surety that he lives and that he is the head. And all that he promised that he said he would do, he will do. Next talk point is transformed through the glory of Christ. When we come to Christ, he reveals to us our true name. John starts, that was so magnificent, that part of your account. You said at one point that you had heard him say your name. And then you realized that every person there had heard their own name. And then you began to see a vision of what was going to happen to you. What your latter day work would be. Is this where they get their missions? And you realized that every person there saw their own journey. Can you tell us about that? Spencer says, it was a Mahonrai Moriankamer experience. When, I don't know how to spell it. It's M A H. O-N-R-I. Uh, I forget how he says it. It was a Moriankamer. Moriankamer was on that mountain. He saw Christ as he saw himself. And he knew him as he knew himself. That is why for Mahonrai, Moriankamer, all things are one eternal now. Is it one eternal now or one eternal round? That's what I want to know. That is why he could see here. This is where the monkeys come in. I'm telling you, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. Melanie Pulaski with her emojis, with monkeys, with their, you know, covering their eyes, ears, mouth. It reminds me of, you know, JJ being bound with his, everything was covered, his mouth. Hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. All right. That is why he could see Christ with the body of flesh and blood. Because he saw him as he will be. And when we were in his presence in that conference center and he spoke our names, when Christ speaks your name, you see yourself as he sees you. And it all floods through your mind. You know who you were, who you are, and who you will become. You will never hear your name ever the same again. For every time that you hear him and he says to you your name, when you prayed, like you said in your talk, 
you remember clearly in every detail how he sees you. Okay. Okay. That's definitely a pattern. Hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. Let me look that up real quick. Okay. So what is the meaning of see no evil, hear no evil, and speak no evil? It says, and this is from bookbrowse.com. What is the meaning? Okay. In English, this expression is generally used in reference to those who choose to turn a blind eye to wrongdoing, but its original meaning rooted in Confucianism is to teach prudence and the importance of avoiding evil. The three wise monkeys are a Japanese pictorial maxim embodying the proverbial principle, quote, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, end quote. The three monkeys are Mazaru, who sees no evil, covering his eyes, Kikazaru, who hears no evil, covering his ears, and Iwazaru, who speaks no evil, covering his mouth. And that's from Wikipedia. Where in the Bible does it say, see no evil? www.churchofjesuschrist.org. They respond, Psalm 23, 1 through 6. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I take a look at my life and realize there's much left because I've been thinking and laughing so long that even my mama thinks that my mind is gone. Even I think my mind is gone. But anyways, I had to do that. <laughs> I hope you get a kick out of that. I can't. Hopefully I edit this shit out. <laughs> I probably won't. Hey, Lord. So it says, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Just let's laugh. Come on. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And another one. What do monkeys mean in the Bible? In Christianity, monkeys represent base instincts such as lust, greed, and malice, and can even represent the devil. Oh my God. What the fuck? That is so fucked up. Even represent the damn devil. Holy shit. Monkey, spirit, animal, symbolism, and meaning. What is the spiritual message of a monkey? The monkey spirit animal represents intelligence, playfulness, and curiosity. This animal can also be a symbol of mischievousness or trickster energy. Oh my God. If you have a monkey as your spirit animal, it may be telling you to lighten up and enjoy more life. Then you have to, you have to hear this one. What does the Bible say about hearing evil? The evil doer is all ears for someone's evil plans. And the liar is happy to be a part of the mischievous and hurtful tales. And this is from Merriam-Webster.com. Speak slash talk of the devil definition and meaning. What does speaking of the evil mean? It says that speak slash talk of the devil used in speech to say that someone one has been talking about has unexpectedly appeared. Quote, well, speak of the devil. We were just talking about you. Unquote. We'll get into raccoons. Y'all. <laughs> Holy shit. What does evils of eyes mean? Evil eyes have always been associated with wanting to inflict pain, harm, or wishing misfortune on others. Giving the evil eye is a clear indication that there is an intention to do something bad to the object or person of focus. Wow. That's at LexiJordanJewelry.com. What are the three evil eyes? Unconscious evil eyes. These types of evil eyes cause harm to people and things without necessarily intending to, do, intending to do so. Conscious evil eyes. These intend to cause harm and bad luck. Unseen evil eyes. These happen to be the most dangerous as they represent hidden evil. And he says to you your name when you prayed, like you said in your talk, you remember clearly in every detail how he sees you. And I was able to see myself as I was as I was at that moment, but even everything that would happen to me and would come to pass in my future. Imagine that brothers and sisters, that will happen to you. If you stay faithful and if you stay believing, you will see his face for his face is the most familiar face of any other face in all of the universe. And his voice is the most familiar voice of any other voice. We know him. All of us have had personal experience with him. He has personally laid his hands on every one of our heads and blessed us with which we are to do, have done, and will do. 
I promise you, I testify to you, that is true. And that is what a millennial church is like. Wink, wink, that is church of the firstborn. Anyways, he is there, personal, present, and you are transformed. John says, so when Joseph heard, quote, Joseph, this is my beloved son, hear him, unquote. Spencer says, or Spencer asks, what did he learn? John says he knew then when he heard his own name, he knew what he would be doing. He knew what he would be doing. Spencer says, so when I bought Kenneth Cope's album, My Servant Joseph, when I heard those words, I thought Kenneth knows, the spirit knows. When you hear your name, you learn more than anything. I hear people all the time saying, quote, Joseph was this ignorant young man, unquote. The Lord allow me to be so ignorant, but he didn't go to college. I have 11 years of college education under my belt. So what? To be taught by Moroni, to be taught by Paul, to be taught by the Savior. And all you have to do is stand in their presence. And when you do stand in their presence, all that is open up to you. Do you understand why Joseph said, quote, many other things were taught to me that day, unquote which I, Joseph, really can't tell you about right here. We'll pick up at preparing a people for the millennium. Sounds interesting. <laughs> preparing a people. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you coming along with me on this crazy shit. <laughs> for this crazy book. That obviously means a lot more than we know. So we're going to find out because that's what we do. We find shit out. Just kidding. Justice for Tylee, Charles, Tammy, JJ, and Joe. Love always wins. You are proof of this. Never forget that. Have a good night.